From Chicago's Can TV, a look at the week's events is reported in the newspapers, in the blogs and online, and on radio and TV. This is Chicago Newsroom. And hello again, welcome to yet another edition, yes, even another edition of Chicago Newsroom as we boldly venture into our second year of existence here on Can TV on Chicago Newsroom. Glad you could join us again today. We, um, we weren't supposed to be here today at all because today is supposed to be my furlough day at Can TV, but I decided, forget it, I'm not taking the furlough day, I'm going to work right through it anyway. So I'll get I'll I'll draw my usual <laughs> paycheck for this. Yeah, well, you know the the county board uh, has had some insurrection, and we may get around to talking about that a little bit today. Uh, whether whether these in these uh, uh, furlough days even work, but we do want to take a moment to welcome Michael Sneed back to the Chicago Sun Times. She's been gone for a long time, and I just can't I can't help but get a little catty, uh, meow, as Sneed would say. Uh, and point out that there, it's just, there's a delicious irony in today's Sneed that uh, obviously uh, Rahm Emanuel's press office has fed her the story about uh, Mayor Daley's daughters used to use their police details to go on shopping errands and babysitting, it, <coughs> that kind of thing. And it just reminded me of all the times when commissioners would wake up in the morning and read about what Mayor Daley thought about the job they were doing because it would get sent to Sneed and Sneed would print that. So how's it feel to be on the other end of that one, huh? So welcome back, Sneed. At last, we know what's going on inside the Rahm administration. <laughs> Yesterday she told us, in fact, that they're not going to close any fire stations or police stations. So we'll, we'll talk about that. With Ahmad Omar joining us today from WBEZ, um, well, sort of from WBEZ at his last Formerly. day yesterday. Yep. Um, very happy to say that you're going to National Public Radio. You're going to be working with uh, a national talk show program? Yep, that's right. Got an editor job over at NPR, so uh, bittersweet. It's sad to leave Chicago, but moving on and starting on Monday. Don't know where I'm going to live, so <laughs> the answer to all of your questions is I don't know, except for I start on Monday, but thank you very much. All you know is Should you're just going to fly to fly to DC go to the NPR building and start working and then when the day is over uh, you got to go someplace find a place to sleep yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> you can couch surf for a while <laughs> exactly. Ernie Sanders is joining us today first time on the show Ernie thank you for being with us thank today. you Ken. Ernie is with the Greater Auburn Gresham Development Corporation yes and an active person in a lot of different things with media and um, uh, the digital divide and somebody who I've I've had a number of encounters with in the past and I thought would be a great person to have on the show because we have a lot of things to talk about, get a status report from Ernie on where things are going in not only Auburn Gresham but in uh, society as in, in general. And also joining us for the first time, Rebecca Vivea. Becky is uh, from the Chicago News Cooperative and she covers, among other things, mostly education uh, stories and, and has been doing a, a great job, I must say, covering that for the CNC, and we're Thank happy you. to have you, have you with us today. Um, not sure where we should start, but, I, but I, I do think it might be interesting. We just touched for a minute there on the closing of police and fire stations. Uh, Rahm Emanuel is hell-bent on reducing this budget, and he seems to at least be willing to be publicly perceived as willing to touch the third rail as often as he possibly can. Mm -hmm. whether, he, whether there's power in the third rail when he touches it, is an, that's a behind-the-scenes issue. But Ahmad, start that for us. Can he close some of the police and fire stations? I mean, politically, it just doesn't seem possible. Well, it's interesting because from all accounts, it seems like he's pretty serious about this. It seems like um, Gary McCarthy, the new uh, chief of the police uh, department, is pretty serious about this. We've seen quotes coming from some aldermen who have been briefed about the situation. They say it's very much on the table. There is that huge budget deficit that you spoke about, so he does need to tackle that somehow. And he also has another goal that he's talked about, and that's increasing the number of officers on the street by about 1,000 cops. And obviously, with the budget situation, that's something that's tough to do. So some people are saying this could be a way where he kind of kills two birds with one stone, closes down a couple of these stations, and gets some more officers out of the desk duty and, and onto the street. So, you know, who knows? He's still early in his tenure. He's not facing a re-election campaign anytime soon, and he does have this huge budget situation to deal with. So if he were to do something like this, I think now would be the time. Will he do it? 
we'll see. M McCarthy made some very interesting comments in the press yesterday about the number of officers it takes to sort of just staff the front desk in a police station. Right. And obviously, you've got three shifts and lots and lots of uniformed uh, people out front that you at least theoretically could fold into a into a different station and then you'd have some guys some guys and women free right whether that really amounts to a large number of people i i just can't tell but there are two things i want to explore here first of all um the man whose name may not be mentioned richard m daly <clears throat> made a big deal out of out of spending lots of money building new police stations and made them lavish with yep. with all the digital rooms with you know camera feeds and everything else and I think made a very credible argument that these became anchors of community and, and they they kind of stabilized neighborhoods that were rocky before so how do you choose where you're going to be able to close police stations you're surely not going to close these stations that the city just spent tens of millions of dollars building. No, uh, from from the rumors that I've read in the papers and you know from from the kind of the scuttlebutt coming out of the administration and the department it seems like the the stations that would be slated to be closed would be probably some of the older ones that aren't quite as new and fancy and up to date mm -hmm. um, some of the ones that were built you know a long time ago and there's also um, a little bit of a talking point that's coming from somewhere is it coming from City Hall I don't know could be that um, you know, people don't really use these as community anchors mm. anymore. You know, people if they need to talk to the police, they call the police on 911. Who goes into the station and files a report anymore? That's kind of mm. one of the counterpoints that you're hearing kind of circulating out there now. So, again, interesting question: Is it politically tenable? Who knows? You know, I mean, you yeah. have the guy to answer that. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sitting there's here no like nobody. waiting to jump in. And, 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 there's and, nobody with his fingers <laughs> more in this stuff than you. So. And uh, I might appreciate your comment, but at least in the area that I work in, in the Arvin Gresham community, uh, that could be farthest from the truth. Our, our CAPS organization is very active uh, within the neighborhood. Uh, our residents commonly, just as something as simple as the community room in the police station, our residents, including our organization, frequently use the community room as an anchor to have folks come in and develop this trusting relationship with the police. There are many other uh, uh, caveats, I would add, in which the police has been very helpful uh, to our community as, as a whole. Uh, we just celebrated our sixth annual 79th Street Festival, mm -hmm. which uh, uh, yielded about 10,000 folks in attendance. And the Chicago Police Department was very much part of the planning and the process. In fact, uh, we closed down 79th Street, which is the busiest thoroughfare in the city of Chicago for the Chicago uh, Transit Authority. Uh, so imagine that the imagine the the strength and numbers that it takes, and the willingness to work with uh, small organizations like ours to really shut down a main thoroughfare to celebrate the community's renaissance. It's it's really great. And I will add too what I will agree with you about uh, regarding the police stations. Our uh, and Mayor Daly was really good at this. Uh, some of the newer police stations are LEED certified. Mm -hmm. So they have all this green technology and, and if you take a look at the economies, the scales, then over the long term it really makes sense for them to build these, these uh, facilities because uh, they're, they're not only green friendly, uh, community friendly, but they're also economically friendly to the uh, administration. So, so I gotta think the Emanuel administration is looking at some of that. And you're thinking then that closing at least some significant number of these is not going to be politically tenable? Uh, yeah, yeah, yes and no in, 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 in the short uh, run. But, I, you know, I'm not a politician. Uh -huh. At least I studied it in, in <laughs> undergrad, but uh, uh, not a politician. And, and who knows what will happen. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, and and w w we can get off this, but but I, yeah. I, the, the other the other part of this is the fire department, which has you know over 50. I think they have something like 54 firehouses, and that is more per square mile than anybody I think mm. except New York. But again, there's a there's this weird balance that you've got to strike when you're when you're a mayor because. Um, as we've noted on this show in the past, the fire department really isn't a fire department anymore. It's an, emer it's an emergency medical team that mm -hmm. also puts out fires on the side. I mm -hmm. mean, that's their major thing now. 
And you want to know that if the big one hits, you want an ambulance at your house within three minutes, and they're not going to be able to do that if they're going to move them five miles to another station. So I have a hard time imagining that there is any alderman in the city of Chicago who's going to actually vote to close a firehouse. Yeah, and, and not to mention the, the power of the, the fire unions and, and folks like that, obviously the political pressure from, from mm -hmm. the public in general. Mm -hmm. And then, as you said, if you know these people are doing the political calculus, they might be saying, well, there's still three years till an, till an election, but if the big one does hit between then and now and the, the mayor has shut down these fire stations, then, mm -hmm. you know, yeah. All hell breaks loose that, for that. Because that's, that's going to be the columnist, yeah. is write the story about how, you know, Joe Smith died because right. he was three minutes, right. he, the fire response was three minutes longer because they, you know, because Rahm Emanuel closed a fire right. station. And right, also, look at uh, uh, Mayor Belandic. He got fired for not shoveling the snow. Mm -hmm. and, mm -hmm. and so, you know, I, th I think some of those same premises are, are being thought out. I don't know that they're as much political as they are much economically inclined. Mm -hmm. Well, and, and also there is a difference between fire and police. I, I'm guessing this. I'm just this, I'm just taking this totally off the top of my head. But fire to, fire stations are much smaller affairs than police stations. These big, you know, heavy metal installations. Fire department. Some of these places are very small. There's just a few people working in them, and and it doesn't seem to me that there'd be a huge savings by closing one of them down. Maybe some maintenance, rent. I don't know. I don't know what it would be. All right, Becky. My observation is that for the first time since Rahm Emanuel became mayor, we've gone through a week where there hasn't been a whole lot of education news. Am I wrong? No, you're not wrong, but I don't think it's going to stay that way. <laughs> so welcome to the show. <laughs> um, so tell us about that. Yeah, yeah, this week has been a little bit quiet. Like I said, I don't think it'll stay that way. We've got the Board of Education next week. Um, the 20th day of school count will be coming up very soon, which can cause a lot of chaos at schools. Mm. Um, because that's when they figure out how many students are enrolled at various schools. Oh, okay. um, Linda Lutton's covered this extensively in the past. Mm -hmm. um, I recommend <laughs> going to her for questions on the 20th day. Um, but yeah, I mean, we've had a lot of action with the longer day, the tensions between ROM and the CTU. Um, you, we talked earlier. Um, one thing that kind of went under the radar, some of the uh, was the issue of recess. Yeah. A lot of parents. Yeah, you've um, written about that. Yes, yeah. I have. A lot of parents. This sort of came up in June, um, May. A lot of parents on sort of the north side. They started this campaign where they, you know, they said we should have recess at our schools. Um, and decades ago, recess was kind of eliminated when mm -hmm. they moved the teachers' lunch from the middle of the day to the end of the day mm -hmm. for safety concerns. Mm -hmm. um, since the school year started, there are actually there were 12 or 13 schools that voted to extend their day by adding recess, but none of them really got any attention because they didn't take Ram up on this offer of $150,000 of discretionary money and um, raises for teachers. So, <laughs> yeah, they kind of flew under the radar. But, and they, but they were, if they voted to add recess, they were extending the school day. Is that correct? They Well, yes. time They were extending the school day, but they weren't in extending instructional time, which is what, right. if you ask central right. office, I mean, they're going to say right. they aren't getting raises because they're not adding instructional time, they're just shifting their day around. So there's no little pot of money <laughs> that you can get some discretionary money right. if you add recess. Right, 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 right. right. But in this debate about a longer day, I think there are a lot of parents that are concerned that they are going to be, that they need to think about what they're going to add to that extra time. Um, that extra 90 minutes, and obviously instructional time is important, but I think that those things like art and recess are very much on the forefront at this point. But the recess is being is being pushed as a kind of a health initiative. Mm -hmm. That's right. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, there, I mean, and and that that does make some sense, but because we're not hearing anything on the. For, we're not hearing any dispatches from the front uh, in the uh, battle between the Rom administration and the CTU. Doesn't mean that things are, are that there's a truce. That things are quiet. No, I don't. Think so. <laughs> <laughs> that 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 war will continue for a while. I would yeah. Guess. Now there was a very interesting thing. I don't know if you, any of you guys actually saw any of it, but the Tribune hosted both uh, the mm -hmm. the head of the CTU and the uh, superintendent, mm -hmm. and they they appeared jointly and they kind of made some news, right? I, I missed this. Oh, you did. All right. Okay. Did I mean they were they were they seemed conciliatory? Yeah. Um. I mean, it's interesting listening to them both 
speak in public together because a lot of the things they're saying are very similar, um, but there are still, I think, deep divides on some of the core issues. And oh, yeah. um, I mean, yeah, it was that was an interesting, the, the forum that the Tribune hosted was interesting because it seemed as though they publicly had a nice little dance, <laughs> but, but it, behind the scenes, I don't think that that's exactly yeah. how it's happening. Yeah. Um, what are you, so. are you hearing anything at all about sort of internal discussions at the CTU that uh, that there's been a lot of narrative in the in the press and and you know conversations like ours that they have been I don't know what the polite word would be to use but kind of outclassed by the Rahm administration that hmm. they, they've been caught flat-footed on a number of things where uh, the administration comes out with something and they're kind of not ready to respond or they look kind of catty in their response like well that wouldn't be enough money for us and you know then the response is but don't you care about the children right I think that there has been kind of a PR war going on between the two and um, up until I think recently the CTU seemed to be right like you said flat-footed um, they I talked to somebody that, that said you know they really just need to stop being so combative and get on the side of the solutions um, I think that they are they have hired um, a number of people to do outreach and research um, and I think they're starting they're going to try to spend this year to do that to position themselves in a good position when they get to the bargaining table but um you know they recently they had this proposal of a longer day that mirrored the lab schools mm -hmm. yeah, where Emanuel yeah. sends his children so th you know that's i think that was a smart move for well them. i have to i have to say that, that we've we've um dished out a lot of uh, of criticism at this table of, of the <laughs> ctu's uh, um uh, you know public sort of public relations game let's put it that way uh and in fact we got in a lot of trouble for actually referring to the school board's uh, uh ability to manipulate them as brilliant and, mm -hmm. and and we didn't mean to say that, that anyway you get the, right. <laughs> however ha having said all of that i gotta say that that it struck me this thing struck me as a sort of a brilliant counter move it's like well then right. why don't we make the chicago public schools more like the one you've oh, elected right. to send your children to, Your Honor. Right. And if we do that, we don't need 90 minutes because your kids don't have 90 minutes. Right. So from a PR move, good, bad? Probably one of their more savvy PR moves lately. Uh, like you said, this battle has been a, a tough one for the CTU since uh, Rahm Emanuel became mayor. The whole extending the school day battle especially is you know, pretty eye-opening as far as it goes and taking, you know, chipping away at the union because um, they're given this 2% raise, I believe, for this mm -hmm. longer for school day, mm -hmm. for, yeah. for extending mm -hmm. the school day, but they're, you know, the CTU had argued all along that we're doing, you know, we're going to be doing about 20% more work or something right. to right. that effect, mm -hmm. and why would we only take a 2% raise? Mm -hmm. And for then, for significant amounts of their rags to, you know, go against the union and say, mm -hmm. yeah, you know what, we'll do it for the kids yeah. Uh, yeah. And, and what have you. It is definitely not only a PR hit, but it's a it's a hit to the very strength of of their organization. So they've got to do something here to change the narrative and and get mm -hmm. momentum back on their side. Do you have any mm -hmm. reason to believe that? What is what is the current number of the of the schools that have broken rank? It's there's it's thirteen. Well, we get a daily briefing. Yeah, on that. <laughs> there's 13. thirteen out of out of six hundred seventy some. So that's another thing that a lot of the the union has been trying to make that point is you know. It may seem like they're being successful. It's an avalanche. Yeah, there's right. this avalanche, but it is sort of, you know, kind of just erosion at this point. Mm -hmm. It could take a lot longer. But, I mean, it, having said that, there are going to be schools that do break off, and additional ones probably before January. But I think they now are realizing that next year we're going to have a longer day regardless. Mm -hmm. And so we need to get into that, like you said, with the, the lab schools proposal. It's, right, we need right. to get into that well, let's try to get on that side and change mm -hmm. that narrative and get on that side of, um, of the solution. And, you know, I think it's, it's interesting, too, in the context of, of what's happening to public sector unions across the nation. And I think that there's a certain, they had a certain resistance prior to this because of what's happening elsewhere, that, mm -hmm. that Ron was doing the exact same thing as, right. you know. Right. Governor yeah. Walker or right, other, right. other governors across the nation, and right. I think it was a very different situation, and they hadn't quite real, realized that. Yeah. I guess. So, um, 
We'll let that one yeah. simmer for another <laughs> week and we'll pick it up because right. we'll always be picking it up again. Uh, a major announcement this week came from the Black Caucus of the City Council of the City of Chicago in recognition that about 60,000, I believe, African Americans have left the city in this, in this most recent census over the last 10 years. And that means that they are going to have to reduce the number of black majority wards in the city of Chicago. It's just, it's just it's, as Barack Obama would say, it's just math, right? Mm -hmm. You got to do it. <laughs> so the Black Caucus got down to work to see what they could do and admitted that, yes, they are going to have to reduce their power in the city council. And they have proposed going from 20 black majority wards to 19. No. <laughs> and my reaction was, why aren't these people advising Obama no, 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 no. on how to negotiate? Because <laughs> he, they seem to be a lot better at it than the president. But anyway, but I digress. So <laughs> what does that mean? Well, like you said, the, the census every 10 years, um, not only in the statewide level, national level as well, but here in the city, um, the, the wards, the, the city council map uh, has to be redrawn. And, you know, like you said, it's, it's a long drawn out negotiation. Yeah. It's something that's not going to be decided overnight. And uh, it, it seemed like a savvy move from the, from the Black Caucus saying, you know, our proposal is to reduce our ranks by by one right and you know they're not ever going to come out with their best offer first right and that one that. by the way is an all is is a ward that the is no longer second right. wards yeah. really it's not even represented by an african American exactly. alderman right. and it's largely i don't know i don't know what the demos are in, in the second ward is it mostly black still i don't even know no, uh there's a great concentration because the the whole area the south loop west loop has gone through gentrification mm -hmm. uh, housing boom what have you uh, really uh, Asian heavy, uh, white, uh, and uh, other. Um, but, it, you know, I, I don't look at this redistrict, redistricting as, as a bad thing. I think one of the things, and, and uh, we, our offices uh, work very closely with the 21st Ward, Howard Brookins, who's the chairman of the Black Caucus. Mm -hmm. uh, one of the things that I know that he and other constituencies are very interested in is strengthening the buying power mm -hmm. within our district, uh, strengthening the buying power among African Americans so that our dollar can speak for itself. Uh, and so other things that we are, are, are really considerate about too is major chains coming into our neighborhoods so that we can work and shop and play and educate you know, our constituency all right in the neighborhood and not necessarily have to go to the second district to make that happen. So mm -hmm. as we begin to strengthen our buying power, then we have more of a say of the type of um, uh, businesses and organizations that come into our community. Do you think it, at this point, matters very much whether wards are, are, are drawn to be a majority white, black, Hispanic? I mean, are, does it, in this, day and age, does it even matter if your alderman is African American or Hispanic or white? I mean, I, I, I ask that question in context with the, the, what, what I perceive to be a real diminishment of the, of the real power of aldermen. Mm -hmm. I mean, they, they just don't seem to be what they were 20 years ago. Mm -hmm. Maybe I'm wrong. So at least in, in the Auburn Gresham community uh, where I, I, I work at, uh, it's uh, the population is is uh, roughly 60 percent, 55 and older, and so those folks are really looking to someone who looks like them, walks like them, talks like them, that could speak for them, and only in that sense do I think that it uh, race does matter mm -hmm, uh, mm -hmm. with respect to who your alderman is. But if you go into a more diverse neighborhood like the second mm. ward, then I don't think necessarily that race. Uh, particularly matters. That's an interesting aspect that I don't think I'd ever really taken into consideration before. The uh -huh. the, 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 the the role that age plays mm -hmm. yes. in this as yeah. as the population ages, the these are folks who have memories of, of things that were very different. That's and, a, and a twenty year old doesn't have that memory. Uh, sure. I could talk about the history of uh, you know just the southwest side and 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 the the migration of uh, what we call uh, white flight overnight white flight yeah, yeah. that happened back in the '60s when uh, uh, Martin Luther King was here marching in Marquette Park mm -hmm. and 
and things of that nature and and uh, and and the blight that occurred even after that transition uh, uh, particularly in Auburn Gresham some years ago there was even a McDonald's uh, there McDonald's is everywhere and McDonald's chose to leave because of the blight that once existed in the community and so uh, through community organizing or organizations like ours and church movement uh, uh, particularly with my parish, St. Sabina Parish, uh, all of those organizing efforts and working with city leaders, uh, again, those who look like us, mm. really fought to uh, have this community be sustainable and really fought to take it back. We have one block club leader who has been a resident for over 40 years in the community uh, whose block was cited as the worst in the country. Uh, at the one worst, point, block, the worst in the country? block in the country. Wow. And in 2008, former President Bush acknowledged her uh, with an award as the best block hmm. in the country. And so all of that just doesn't happen, yeah. you know, by happenstance, yeah. but, you know, uh, uh, community organizing and mobilizing folks as such to, to really take back what was once. Taken away. Ernie, you know, I, I'm just getting the signal here. We're down to our last couple of minutes on the show. And one of the reasons that I really wanted to have you on the mm -hmm. show, if we can possibly do this relatively quickly, is you've spent so much of your time talking about the digital divide and, and the, 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 the lack of Internet access for impoverished communities. Can you give us a kind of a quick thumbnail update on what's going on with that and answer the question that that's on my mind that mm -hmm. practically everybody is walking around now with a smartphone in their pocket so they have internet access is it possible that technology has leapfrogged the digital divide so uh, uh, so as a community practitioner we we like to look at the cup being half full and we uh, respectively are um, aiming towards digital excellence and everyone being digitally inclusive. And smartphones, as it stands right now, is a, a movement that's happening not just in, in our neighborhoods, but everywhere. Uh, and so I, just kind of a, a brief update with the Smart Communities Initiative is what you're referring to. Uh, we, have, we are on the, uh, uh, kind of on the cusp of uh, doing this broad, wide marketing campaign which you'll see uh, in five neighborhoods, Auburn Gresham, Chicago Lawn, Inglewood, Pilsen, and Humble Park. And you'll see residents who are talking about their experience, their digital experience, and their digital platform, if you will, and how this initiative is helping them to become much more digitally inclusive. Well, and we'll have to get another update on that another time. So we'll, we'll, keep, we'll, keep, we'll have you keep us informed on that. Great. Sorry, Thank we're going to have to run. Becky Vivea, thanks very much thanks. for joining us today thanks and hope you'll me. come back again. Ernie Sanders from the Greater Auburn Gresham Community uh, Council. And, and for the last time, Ahmad mm -hmm. Omar from WBEZ, formerly WBEZ, uh, now yeah. National Public Radio. Thanks, thanks for sir. joining us today. Thank you. It's been really nice having you here. You know, this is, uh, the program is available to you here on CAN TV, and you can see this and plenty of other shows by just going to CAN.com blip.tv. Isn't that what it is? I think that's what it is. It's blip TV. And you can also go to can TV and get and get it there. And you can also subscribe to us on iTunes video and audio. Thanks so much for watching. We'll be back again next week with another show. And I'll be off of my uh, my um, what are those things called? Furl. Furl. I'll be off of furlough. See you next week. Bye bye.